Okay, I am in Forest Grove Cemetery again today. Um, I like walking around in cemeteries and this time it's not really a leisurely walk. I'm actually looking for a specific headstone of um, one of our past governors here in Maine. Well, he was a governor, but he, he was more importantly known as a, um, a Maine senator, especially during the Civil War. And I know his brother's buried over there. I don't think they would be buried next to each other, but they might be. I just haven't been able to find find the stone. Um, so the stone is for Lot Myrick Morrill. Um, see, I think that's Anson, his brother. Yeah. And anyway, um, it's hot out here. It's hot and very sunny. Um, so here we are in this cemetery. This is um, a political cemetery, Augusta's political cemetery. Let me just take a seat for a second. I want to show you his monument because, um, well, because he's important to Mainers. He's important to this Mainer anyway. Um, he was actually, he was elected to the Senate in 1861, right about the time that the war, the Civil War broke out. He took the place of Hannibal Hamlin, who was tapped by Abraham Lincoln to be vice president. Um, he was elected into that position right after he left um, the governor's seat here in Maine. He was elected the governor to the governor's seat and re-elected twice. He was really, he was really popular. Um, anyway, he had already served in the House of Representatives of Maine. He had already served um, as the Maine, um, as the chairman of the Maine Democratic Party. Um, he left that party two years later and joined the Republican Party, which his brother started, Anson Morrill started. Um, and he was elected to the Maine State House for, I think it was one term, but whatever it was, when he entered into the Maine State House, they asked him if he would be the um, president of the Senate. So this guy had leadership ability from, it was noticed from the start. And when he went to, when he went to Congress, as a senator from Maine to take Cannibal Hamlin's place, that didn't stop. They recognized him as a leader there also. So I'm gonna walk around here. Um, anyway, more, more information. Um, he was, let me see here, he was, he was known for a lot of things. I am bottlenecking all this information that's coming forward. Um, he was known for protecting um, Native American rights. And he was known for, um, cause he was on the, the Indian Affairs Committee, when he was in the Congress his first time, his first seven years, he was actually there for 15 years. It was split in half though, because at the end of his first seven years, he didn't get reelected. Um, I think he headed back to Maine, but whatever happened, we at Maine has two senators. One of the senators was Senator Fessenden. He died while he was in office. He was in office at the same time as Morrill, when Morrill was there for his first seven years. Um, so when he went home, Fessenden was still here, but Fessenden died. So lot did like a special election or something but he uh, wound up win winning that and he took Fessenden's place um, finished out his term and then got elected to another um, I don't know what you call it stint I guess so he was there for seven years and then another seven years while he was I really want to find the stone and it has to be around here somewhere while he was in the Senate the first time he was actually a member of the Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee, which is a big one. But also, he was in the Senate Appropriations Committee. And if you pay attention to politics today, you know how important that committee is. It's like the pinnacle of all of the committees. He was actually made the, the chairman, like the head of that, for two of his first seven years. And when he went in for his second term, seven year term, he was made um, the, the chairman or the head of it again for, for one year. Oh boy. Yeah, I was really thinking it would be like right in this area. It's, it should be a big monument. He did big things. Let's see if we can, see there is, there's Anson. Is this his brother behind him? 
There's like nothing on. There's nothing on this one. Let me just see if this. The, this is. Oh no. This says. It says Pierce. Hobbs, Pierce, Barbier, Barbier. This is Anson, and I thought I could see. I thought I was able to see um, lots monument from here. I thought I came down here and saw it once. Well, anyway, so he was born in 1813. He's 10 years younger than his brother Anson. This is Anson's monument right here. Um, he pretty much followed in his brother's footsteps, in politics anyway. They thought the same. Lot was all about educating the public, and so was Anson. A lot of people don't know that. Um, I guess you'd have to really kind of do a deep dive into Maine history to figure out, figure these things out. But Lot also wanted all slaves released, set free, and educated. It was a big thing for him. He he was a defender of Indian rights, a promoter of educating the population of recently freed slaves. But another thing that he was known for was um, when the war broke out, there was still, when the Civil War broke out, there there was still slaves in Washington, D.C. when he got there. And he was like, we're going to war against the South to free, you know, to, to get these fr slaves freed. And here we are working in Washington, D.C., the capital of, of the Union, and there's slaves down here, um, you know, because he's from, from Maine. And he said, this needs to stop. And a bunch of voices in the Senate pushed it forward, and they, were, they, they made it happen that they freed the slaves. And not only, he didn't only just want them freed, he wanted them educated as well. And not just educated, he wanted them educated or to have the resources that the average white male has at their disposal. He wanted them to be able to be educated to that degree also because it was important that they were able to read contracts and sign documents and he also wanted them to be able to vote. I am having a heck of a time. I thought for sure it would be right in sight of Anson's monument but I do not see it and it's super hot out here right now. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a scan around here. I thought I saw it the other day. I thought I like to I like to walk around the cemeteries. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do. I mean, look at you, you, the history in these cemeteries is amazing. The artwork is incredible. I mean, look at this. Look at this. Let me show you this. I mean, you can even like read really cool things on it, like Reverend Joseph Ricker, D.D., 1814 to 1897, something counselor, a f friend to education, a faithful minister of the gospel after he had served his generation by the will of God fell on sleep. And then it says, Ann J., his wife, Howard C. Ricker, inherited at New Gloucester. I interred at New Gloucester. Anyway, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, so, what is there to say about Lot Myrick Morrill? He was known for his highly ethical nature, and his moral compass always pointed north. Moral compass, not moral compass, because <laughs> his name is M O R R I L L. M O R R I L L. Honestly, I have completely lost his monument. All right, I'm gonna regroup. I'm gonna regroup down here. It's hot. It's like 84 with a 67 or 74 percent humidity. Last time I looked. 
in Maine that's hot. Might not be hot for you guys, but here in Maine it's pretty warm. Um, all right, just I'm gonna regroup for a second and I'll be right back. I might have found it. There's a bunch of cemeteries um, up on this hill um, in Augusta. The hill goes up to the the top of the hill is the um, the airport, and right abutting the airport boundary is a cemetery on one. So it's on the other side of the road here. We're on one side of the road. The, that cemetery is on the other side of the road. But there is that cemetery, a cemetery inside that cemetery, and a cemetery right after that cemetery so there's like three cemeteries right there on this side there's forest grove cemetery and there's a bunch there's a couple of memorials at the top of the hill that are right across the street and i use the word street very lightly because there's not even any lines in the road where the um main national guard i think is a, like a big military building up there there's so across the street is a memorial to um, senator blaine who ran for president um, one time so it's a big monument up there for him and then um, there's another big whole monument area for Senator um, Governor Chick Burley Governor Burley and then there's like the cemetery part right and then there's another cemetery right below this cemetery St. Mary Cemetery and I don't know where they end I don't know where this one ends and St. Mary's begins <laughs> so I just like walk around in here I don't know where the boundaries are um, but I came a little bit lower in the for lower than the Forest Grove Cemetery boundary line, thinking maybe I didn't know what, where the boundary was, and I think that's right because there's a moral there's a moral monument right here. So if I find if this is the moral monument I'm looking for, then we're gonna experience this together. So here we go. I'm just gonna go look up here. Let's see if I can get up here. the sun I don't think this is it because I don't remember anything about s someone being born in Calais Calais oh it is it is it is look 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 lot M moral It's got this big tree going, well, it's not big, but it's a tree. It's growing in front of it. Uh, let's see here. Lot, Lottie E, daughter of Lot Mora, Lot Myrick, and I can't remember what his wife's name is. C.H. Morrill. She was born in 1860 and died in 1894. He was born, it says 1812, and uh, died in 1883. It's weird because online a lot of information about him says he's born in 1813 so I don't know I don't know why the discrepancy let's see who's over here yep yeah. right here on the edge here wow this is something Charlotte Vance wife of Lot Myrick Morrill born Callis Maine in 1827 died in Augusta in 1918 Jeez, this is almost disrespectful in a way. This guy is responsible for a lot of really great things for Maine and also the representation of Maine in a national spotlight. To see his, to see this taken care of like this, it just upsets me. Um, Lot Myrick Morrill, born, you see, this one says 1813. Look, see if I can get you. See, this one says 1813. That's when I, May 3rd, 1830, that's what I thought. But this, he died in 1883. But this, uh, this monument right here says eight, I don't know if you can see, it says 1812 to 1883. Anyway, it's nice and sun, uh, shady right here. So I will sit here and tell you a little bit about Lot Myrick Morrill. You can see the monument, right? It's almost as big as his brother's. He was in con he was in Congress for almost like right around 15 years, two different um, 
runs of like seven years each or seven and a half years each. Um, I think his monument should be bigger, but and I definitely think it shouldn't be hidden back here. It's there's nothing really special about this besides the monument itself. I mean, I just would have expected it to be a little more ornate for for what he did for the country. He was a very in, influential senator. So five things I think you should know about Lot Myrick Morrill. The first would be his stance on slavery. He was anti-slavery before he even, I mean his whole life, before he got to Congress, no, way before that, like his whole life. He was a fan of freeing all slaves and educating them. That was very important. Um, when he got to Washington DC in 1861, there were slaves in Washington DC and he found that weird. He, you know, he, he was among the voices that said, we've just gone to war with the South over slavery. Why do we have slaves in the capital of the Union? I guess that made an impression because they freed the slaves. I want to tell you about the Compromise of 1850 while I'm here, while I'm talking about this. The Compromise of 1850 brought um, California into the Union as a non-slave state. It's important to know that there's a lot of things in the Compromise of 1850 I'm not going to get into them, but the one that I will get into is that um, all the slave houses, all the slave trading houses and markets in Washington, D.C. had to be shut down. Why is this important? Why is it important to know? Because Washington, D.C. was the nation's hub, one of the nation's strongest hubs, most popular, most prosperous, most wealthy hubs for slave trading. So the slave trade, slave trade um, marketplaces, um, houses, anything to do with trading slaves, they all had to be shut down. But they did still allow slaves in the, the district limits. So he said let's free them, along with a bunch of other people, and then let's educate them also. The second thing I think you should know about Lot Myrick Morrill is that, the second thing, is that uh, his pos would be his position on readmitting the southern states back into the Union. The southern states seceded and um, you know in the Civil War we lost right around 620,000 American men and boys and I'm sure some women too but mostly just men and boys. Lot did not see any sense in punishing this, the states for doing what they did. Um, the war was enough. We had lost that almost a million, you know, a little a little more than half a million um, Americans, and that was punishment enough as far as he was concerned. But he was a fan of the he was a fan of the Military Reconstruction Act. The Military Reconstruction Act essentially put the South into five separate districts, and each district was governed by a Union military leader, like a Union general. This could not have been a good time to be living in the South. I mean, can you imagine having Robert E. Lee coming up to the North and being like, you need to follow my rules, and until you follow my rules, you cannot rejoin the, <laughs> they must, it must have been terrible um, and very tense. But anyway, um, they, in order to rejoin the Union, um, each state had to, they had a checklist of things that they had to do. And one of the things they had to do was, well, two of the things they had to do were to, create a new state constitution and in that state constitution they had to put the 13th amendment which is there's no slavery anymore freeing all the slaves and there is no slavery and the 14th amendment did i say that right the 13th amendment which is freeing the slaves and then the 14th amendment which is making them citizens this was a very very big problem for the south and i'll explain a little bit more about that later um, but he was very much, they need to follow these rules. So he was one of the senators that said, this has to be done in order for them to come back. Every single state in the South, except for Tennessee, i um, not really sure why Tennessee didn't have to follow these rules. Maybe they already did follow the rules. But I will say that the president at the time, because Abraham Lincoln had died, um, was Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was his vice president, and Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee. So maybe Tennessee was ahead of the curve, or maybe he was playing favorites, and that's a possibility. I will get to that in a minute. Um, the third thing I think you should know about Lot Myrick Morrill was his stance on voting rights. He was a strong proponent of all free men, not women, because we haven't gotten there yet in history, all free men um, having the right to vote. 
but and what I'm about to say sounds controversial in 2022 but this is this is uh, the 1860s you know this is like late 1860s like 1867 1868 somewhere around there he's pushing for a literacy test to be able to vote and this sounds in 2022 this is like what a literacy test no that's not a good thing remember when I said that he wanted to free the slaves he also wanted to educate them a lot of these slaves almost all of these slaves were not educated and it was illegal to teach slaves how to read and write in a lot of the south right so you're freeing massive amounts of slaves to now they're free people who can't read or write they can't even read or write their own names this is a problem right so what he's saying is let's let's make a literacy test it's not to put his thumb on them and to push them down and to make it impossible for them to vote that wasn't his angle his angle was well i guess we need to teach these guys how to read and write now right don't we in order for them to exercise their constitutional rights as citizens of this country they have to know how to read and write in order to vote so we have to make that available to them make teachers available to them make reading classes you know literacy classes all that sort of thing available to them that's what he was going he was he was trying to raise the bar on society okay um Whereas what you probably learned and I also learned um, through like high school um, history is that the South saw that as a loophole. And so they started putting kind of like a loophole. They started putting like these gatekeeping kind of restrictive laws in place to make sure that only certain people could vote. If you couldn't pass a literacy test, you couldn't vote. Well, that was almost, you know, at, at the time that the, the, the slaves got free, that was almost all of them. Um, so their votes wouldn't count because they, they wouldn't be able to cast their votes. They also did things like you have to own land, you have to pay taxes, you know, you have to, you know, do all, whatever it is that you have to be able to do. They put all these in place to stop people from being able to vote, specifically black people. They did not want their, their votes to be counted. Okay. So he was a huge proponent of voting rights and especially for, um, newly freed slaves. The fourth thing I think you should know about Lot Myrick Morrill was his position on gold back currency. He was a very strong proponent of the nation's money being backed by gold. Up to this point, there had been money printed in different parts of the country and it was floating around all over the place, but it didn't mean anything. And so the money's the money system wasn't backed by anything. So you never knew like how much this is it even worth the paper that it's printed on. A lot of times it wasn't. So he wanted to bring stability to the nation's he wanted to bring stability to the nation's financial situation by backing all of our money with gold. Okay, so that's the fourth. The fifth, which I've saved for last, is the longest. Um, the fifth thing I think you should know about Lot Myrick Morrill was his ethical standard and his moral compass. Um, he was known for being a leader. He was known for doing the right thing. He was known for um, representing the right side of the argument almost all the time. Let me, let me explain. When Abraham Lincoln died, he had this he had this vice president who was from the South. When the South was going to secede from the Union, um, there was all kinds of talk for a really long time. This didn't just happen overnight, right? But in one of the final meetings where the South, all the Southern like, rep um, like representatives and congressmen, they all met. And they, were, they talked amongst themselves and they said, are we going to do this, um, basically? And of course, the answer was yes. But there were a couple of stragglers that didn't go with them. They were Southern, but they stayed with the Union. They pledged their loyalty to the Union, and one of them was Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson pledged his loyalty to the Union, and Abraham Lincoln look, looked at him and said, that's my man, that's my guy. Why? Because he's a Southern Democrat, and I need somebody to appeal to the Northern Democrats, because there's a, there is Confederate sympathy up here in the North. This guy can talk to them, you know, and, and get them to vote for me, right? So he puts Andrew Johnson on his ticket. Well, Abraham Lincoln dies. When Abraham Lincoln died, of course, the newspapers, media, it, you know, whoever was available it was, was, 
went to the senators on the hill and asked like what do you think is going to happen here is this is this, how tragic is this and the senator said no it's all right don't worry andrew johnson's going in office it's fine everything's going to work out great don't worry andrew johnson exposed who he really was and he never really hit it it's just like nobody really had any reason to know anything about him right i mean he was from a very southern area tennessee and i don't want to sound too harsh but he was about as racist as a, as you might imagine I'm, i don't want to i i don't want to offend anybody but he was a southern white democrat racist he was about as racist as could be he was very racist um so when when lincoln died and he was put in charge um congress started doing what they were doing before. They were trying to unite the union again and passing all these laws, civil rights laws, civil rights laws, civil rights bills, um, packages to help, um, you know, the farmers down in the south um, because we're talking about a complete change of course for them now that they can't have free labor and they're going to have a hard time maintaining their plantations and their crops and all that sort of thing. Um, they were having a hard time, so they were passing they were passing bills and acts and legislation to help them. And what they noticed was that they put these bills onto the president's desk, and he would sign all of the ones that helped the southern farmers. He would help all. He would sign all the ones that would help the states, the southern states. It would make them make it easier for them to rejoin the union. But he wouldn't sign anything to do with helping ex-black slaves. You know you know like join into the union in a productive way you know right now what we have is a whole a, like a large population of people that are very uneducated and they're not integrated into this into society right they're they're not integrated into it they're 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 a part of it but they're like always on the outside and nobody was happier about that than andrew johnson andrew johnson didn't stay with the union because he had strong feelings for freeing black slaves that is not the truth that couldn't be further from the truth as a matter of fact if the south would have won this thing if they would have won the war and andrew johnson could go back to tennessee with a bankroll in his pocket and he could buy slaves to work for him he absolutely would have done that the, he, there was no love lost between him and and black people and i don't want to say black slaves i just mean black people in general so he pledged his he pledged his loyalty to the union because he was he was raised in such a poverty stricken environment and it you know it only got as better as he could make it for himself he was not educated formally in any way his parents could not afford for that to happen for him so he didn't have any formal education he didn't have a big business to go back to he didn't have any slaves he was you know flicking his nose to all of these rich white plantation owners um, who had all kinds of slaves. He did not represent them in the Senate. So when they decided to leave and secede, he was not going with them. That's who he was, that's who he was snubbing. He wasn't saying, oh, I'm a big, I'm a big, um, you know, proponent of freeing slaves. No, he was not a proponent of freeing slaves. And it became very evident when uh, Congress Put these bills on his desk and he he would either sit on them and not sign them or just veto them outright like he was not interested in helping black slaves ex-black slaves at all to any degree this came to a head when the when congress put in front of him a civil rights bill that was it was agreed to by like all parties involved i don't know how i don't know how to say this i don't know who voted for it. all i know is when i read about it um, in depth, it said, it said that it was a miracle. It, it was considered a miracle of the, t of the time that they got the signatures needed to put this on the president's desk. They were so happy. They were, they were so happy. They put it on his desk. He looked at it. He was like, oh my gosh, this is quite an achievement. Veto pushed it off to the side and just went on with whatever. And Congress was stunned. They were beside themselves. They did not even know what to do. Like, what do we do now? Like, this is they're trying to unite the union and here's this guy who has no desire whatsoever for things to go smoothly he knows that they need to come back into the union but if it comes at the cost of saying that 
the ex-slaves are citizens of, of the, those states that they're in down there? They're now citizens with voting rights? No. Nope. He is not a fan of that. Andrew Johnson was so opposed to this that he was actually sending messages to the South telling the South, do not agree with this. You don't have to let them be citizens of your state. This That's ridiculous. You don't have to. And you know, this was causing so much infighting in the states. It was making it hard for those states to rejoin the Union. They had, they were fighting amongst each other. They couldn't, they weren't fighting against the North anymore. They were fighting against each other. Not only were the abolitionists fighting against the ex-slave owners who had just lost all their slaves, they're fighting with each other, but these ex-slave owners are hunting down these free slaves and like, I'm sorry, but they're slaughtering them in the night sometimes. They're break, crashing in their doors and shooting entire families. I mean, th this is what's happening down there. And you've got the president of the United States telling them they're not citizens and you don't have to let them be citizens. I mean, while Congress is trying to unite the union, right? So Lot has no love for this guy at all. Every time they put a bill on his desk that gives the South an easier way to join the union, he signs it. Every time they put a bill on his desk that, that gives money to Southern um, farmers to make life easier for them because their lives have really been flipped upside down after losing their free labor. You know, we have to have a little bit of sympathy. We don't want to sink the country because of this. He signs it. He signs it and it sends the help down to the South. That's great. But whenever something is put on his desk that helps the newly freed black population, he either sits on it or vetoes it outright. So Congress started scratching their heads saying, you know, we've been fighting this guy for quite a while now and he's kind of like, you know, he's kind of a jerk and he's not trying at all. As a matter it's not that he's not trying to, to, to bring the, the country together. He is actively fighting against bringing the country together. We're putting things on his desk that are, that, that are our efforts to try to reunite the union and he's saying that's not going to happen. We need to get rid of him. We need to vote this guy out. Um, and nobody wanted that more than Lot Myrick Morrill. So he says, "All right, yeah, I'm in on that. Let's let's start the impeachment process." So the impeachment process the impeachment process went through, but the problem was that Andrew Johnson never did that one specific thing that would get him impeached. You know, where you can look, you know, where wherever the rules of impeachment are, you can look and say he broke this rule. He never did anything like that. He just didn't work well with others. He did not work well with others. Um, so the impeachment process went through, um, everyone did their long-winded speeches, and there were some really good speeches. And even the people that didn't want to vote for impeachment because they didn't think they could, they listened to the speeches and said, that was a really good speech. You had some really great points, but here's the thing. Can we really impeach this guy because we don't like him? Can we? And if we do that, what does that do for the the presidential seat in the future like this office this sacred office you know i mean if we can just say well we don't like him what does that mean in the next the next time around when congress you know is mostly democrat and they don't like the republican president what's going to happen there they just don't like him so we, we can't do this lot saw the big picture but he still voted for impeachment and it didn't work out Andrew Johnson was not impeached. Not that time, anyway. He was impeached in a follow-up impeachment trial, which they actually trapped him into. Um, I'll get into that very briefly. They passed a Tenure of Office Act, which said that if you um, want somebody to be appointed to your cabinet, you have to go through us first, uh, Congress, and Congress will give its approval. When you want to fire somebody, the Tenure of Office Act, when you want to fire somebody, you also have to go through us. They quietly passed this Tenure of Office Act, right? And knew that he wasn't working well with others, especially not his Secretary of War. His cabinet was inherited. His cabinet was put together by Lincoln. He didn't get along with almost anybody in his cabinet. He definitely did not get along with Stanton. Um, and at one point he said he wanted to fire Stanton. And uh, everybody knew that that was going to happen anyway, so they passed this Tenure of Office Act. And they get, uh, he goes to fire Stanton they said you can't do that yet you got to go through us so he said okay fine can I can I fire him and they said they said okay yeah no no you can't sorry you can't so he said I'm the president and he fired him anyway well that was an impeachable act and that's how he got impeached he broke a specific act which by the way became if he would have challenged it he probably would have won but he didn't challenge it 
Um, if you, it, it actually became an unconstitutional thing, and it, it was known, it became unconstitutional. You can't do that anymore. So the president can fire anybody who's on his cabinet if he wants to now. Um, but anyway, so these are five things that you should know about Lot Myrick Morrill. I wish I was a little smoother about presenting them, but it's a lot to remember. It's just exciting. Okay. Um, he also. <laughs> I did, I talked your ear off. I, I knew I was going to do it. I tried not to, but I did it. I'm sorry. Okay. I guess that's it. Um, I'm off to look at this monument. So, till next time.